Uh, today is Tuesday, October 8th, 2019. We're doing chapter 22 of Human Action, a treatise on economics, the scholar's edition, following the study guide by Robert Murphy. The title of this chapter was The Non-Human Original Factors of Production. What did you uh, think of this one? Um, the first part was kind of hard because it was just, uh, I don't know. It was talking about the different, I mean, I thought it was interesting, but when they talk about different type of economic theories and economic thought and like the shortcomings of one versus the other, it was scrambled. Yeah, the Ricardian. This yeah, and that. I mean, like, I had to, I had to listen to it again, but like I understand it now. Yeah, I was wondering when is he gonna get to cattle, you know, like non-human factors of production. I was it's just cattle was all <laughs> I was thinking of. He never mentioned it once. Yeah, but I, I suppose he would say like it's related to land or it's somehow or maybe it's just not. There's involved. brief mention of hunters. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and also of water is considered land too. Mm -hmm. And anyway. Um, study question one, general observations concerning the theory of rent. Why are land and the services that it renders dealt with in the same way as other factors of production and their services? Because they, I mean, they're all factors of production, I believe. They kind of follow the same type of rules. Land has a finite amount of resources or you can get a finite amount of production from a certain piece of land so it has a price yeah and i consider it to be an input into a system that produces wine for example you need the land to produce the grapes to produce the wine so mm. it's a factor of production yeah why or what is the greatest merit of the ricardian theory of rent according to mises Without checking, I think I'm going to, I, I recall him saying it was the way Ricardian theory of rent describes the wages that a, a person can earn as rent mm -hmm. when they involve better production methods, they can charge higher rent. Um, it's not the way I would word it today, like, yeah, but I think that was an innovation of the Ricardian theory. I thought one of the more interesting things was not in, uh, in innovation, but one of the shortcomings they talked about was they assumed that these like, uh, English businessmen from like the middle ages, they were assuming that their motive was to control the total uh output of a means of production and distribution like that's what their goal was um but that's not like their the goal of the businessmen was to seek profit versus getting control of the total output right but then that made sense back then but it seems like it's kind of flipped to trying to to today's business like amazon isn't about profit amazon's about gaining the total um they're trying to control the distribution and get the most um of the distribute the most of the total production hmm hmm mises addresses that in this chapter that one of the factors um, of production, so to speak, is taxes. Like, so there, there are plunderers and, and mm -hmm. people who are thieves who, if the thieving is too much, people will not produce hmm. profits. Right. And so it could be explained that Amazon and the behavior of companies like it is influenced by the plunder they expect 
if they were yeah, to produce profits. They're clearly not incentivized to generate a profit. And they 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 seem to think it's not in their best interest. Yeah. yeah. Which seems kind of warped. Not ideal. Yeah. Well, fortunately, they they seem to be doing something useful with their profits, which is reinvesting. And hopefully there will be a time when they can have profits and they'll be massive. I hope. Time factor in land utilization. How is the factor of time important for the utilization of land? So the when you when someone charges a price of land, it's like the price of land now or you calculate it based on like time interval steps and the originary rate of interest. So, like, if I'm paying land now, it's like the summation of the land in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So, it's like, if I'm selling you a plot of barren land, and I'm like, there's nothing going on here, I wouldn't be like, oh, this is $1. You know, Mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, this is $50,000, because I expect that every year you're going to be able to produce so much yield that that you'll be able to pay for that in time, and it's going to be worth it. You'll be able to produce more than $50,000. Right. Which institutional conditions can affect the utilization of land? Taxes. Yeah. Uh, become a, a... They reduce the price of land. So if the land is $50,000 for me, but then there's a $10,000 tax every year on it, then I'm going to have to re- reduce the cost a lot. Right. Maybe, maybe make it twenty five thousand or something to make it more attractive because you're gonna have to pay that price anyway. Mm-hmm. Is the assertion that land cannot literally be consumed relevant to the explanation of land as a factor of production? No. No. Uh, land can't literally be consumed, but also iron and other um, industrial equipment mm-hmm. isn't consumed. Right. Um, it still exists in a cosmic sense, but in the economic catalactic sense, it's no longer useful. Same as if land, you grow tobacco for a bunch of years and then it's like totally shot and you can't grow anything for a while. The submarginal land. What is the value of submarginal land? I don't remember. I don't remember submarginal land, to be honest. A given piece of land can only yield a finite amount of services. That is why land is an economic good, rather than a general condition of the environment. However, the quantity of available land is so large that at any given time, the binding constraint is the scarcity of labor and capital goods available to work the land. This is why people exploit only the most productive parcels of land, giving rise to the marginal land that yields no rent. Okay, so basically because there is land, um... Submarginal land comes about because there is land that can be productive and used. But it's not being used? So, like, land in the heart of Port, uh, Portsmouth is optimal land because of its location and it's easy to, to... There's plenty of people around the land to work it and make it productive versus submarginal land would be like out in like the boondocks where nobody's there and it's all swamp that's submarginal land and what is the value of submarginal land it's worthless oh (laughs) (laughs) okay 
Under which conditions would an increase in the amount of land increase the supply of cereals, etc.? So the you also need workers and capital to work the land. They're talking about cereals as in like breakfast? I think so, yeah. Okay. So yeah, if so however the quantity of available land is so large that at any given time the binding constraint is scarcity of labor and capital goods. So there needs to be labor and capital goods too work the extra land like uh, let's say you had no capital and um, no labor to work that plot of land in ports this or to Portsmouth it's useless right it will not produce more cereal yeah uh, without the labor and the capital equipment mm -hmm. the land as standing room I loved this section this I made a lot of sense to me I never thought about it this way is it inefficient to place an apartment building <clears throat> on arable farmland? What do you think? No. Why not? Because sometimes people demand apartments. People want the, you know, yes... You don't want to put apartments on farmland. You want to put farms on farmland. Yeah. But farms will go... Whoever wants the land the most will pay the highest price. And people are willing to pay more for apartment buildings and living spaces. So they might just pay more than the, the, farm, the farmer. So uh, how would it be inefficient to place... Does that answer the question? It seems. Is it inefficient? Oh, um, is it? So it's not inefficient. Yeah. Okay. Cool. The prices of land. How do the prices of land differ from those of other factors of production? I guess I didn't answer the last question completely. I think I, to, to give an economic answer... It would be inefficient to place an apartment building on arable farmland if you can make more from the farm. Mm -hmm. If you can make more from the apartment building, which you almost certainly could, given that housing prices or people are willing to pay more for housing than they are for farmland, then it wouldn't be inefficient. Yeah. You would have to project, though, the how long that apartment building will last and like will that apartment building ruin the soil for future farmland mm. yeah good point how do the price of land differ from those of other factors of production I would say trick question. They yeah, don't. I'm not sure it does. They, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the ways that the prices of land differ from those mm -hmm. of other factors of production, and I don't think they do. I think this is um, Mises making a point to form previous economists who falsely claimed that land was special. Mm -hmm. What is the myth of the soil? I'm just going to read this section. Please. Um, romanticists condemn economics in modern society for treating land as a mere factor of production rather than a noble source of li livelihood and indeed virtue for those tilling the soil. Yet actual peasants do not harbor such notions which were invented by city dwellers. Those working the land understand that it, it is means for the satisfaction of wants and treat it accordingly. This kind of made sense when he talked about, like, the Himalayan people, um, 
like they didn't treat like the mountains as like sacred or until like they saw like people would pay to hike up them or yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah the people just use the land and it's like the outsiders that are <laughs> make it sacred or yes yeah you know. isn't that interesting it was the city dwellers coming as tourists to these places that were like oh the land it's so beautiful and everyone who lives there is just like uh yeah it produces wheat and grain for us that's all we care about that's what it can produce and the great point was made that hunters and and gatherers would be similarly disturbed if there were mystics in the past saying oh you agricultural people who are like planting plants that's not what this land is for it's for hunting mm. you're ruining the sacredness of the <laughs> of like our the way we use this land yeah it's it was a quick paragraph and a quick way to phrase it so i'm not fully convinced that's the way it is what that's a silly the city dwellers that give like romanticism to the lands outside yeah. yeah i'm sure there are people who are from the farm who see it as beautiful and yeah are attached to it yeah right so but they don't give it as much economic value cuz they're not coming to be tourists to pay just to see the land or to pay to preserve it as an unworked land. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess I'm not very, I'm not convinced of that. Seems like a pretty big absolute. And I'm sure there's many different situations where that happens. But I, I just, I don't know enough. Well, I would think the existence of things like national parks would suggest that it's people from other places who put a monetary value on the ability to visit these places yeah, and have them be untouched. But that, that's true, but that also doesn't prove that, you know, like an indigenous people don't have a national park, like some, or sacred land, like, mm -hmm. like Native Americans had sacred land. I think I don't know if not about their culture, <laughs> but I don't know either. Right, so it's it. I just I uh, can't really. Well, I know from where I grew up, there was a cornfield across the street from my house, and then they put up a bunch of townhouses, and that's what I would be considered. That's what I would have considered sacred land for my town, my mm -hmm. neighborhood. That's where the kids played with their dirt bikes and stuff, but it was destroyed through for economic gain people were like we got to put apartment houses here yeah. instead of corn and in this way like land use is always changing for the greater benefit of meeting our economic wants and needs i can get more yeah i mean who's having... economic wants and needs <laughs> our it's like it's an individual's right good point but I would argue that if he can pay more for that land as a as an um, housing developer mm -hmm. than the farmer can pay as a farmer, then he is able to produce more profits and put more goods and services into the economy. Right. That benefits me. True. Okay. Well, that was chapter 22.